I'm Larry, and this is the Old Gazer channel, uh, which is a, uh, a channel for beginning or inexperienced amateur astronomers, uh, and the goal of which is to try to provide some practical information to help beginners along the way. So, uh, uh, welcome, and uh, let's just get started with today's video. Uh, uh, you may wonder why I'm doing this particular video now. It's probably one that I should have done much earlier in the series, back near the beginning, in fact, but as they say, better late than never, so we're going to do it now. Uh, today, I want to talk about some accessories or some things that, uh, that you might uh, find valuable or, or of great benefit to you when you go outside to view or image things through your telescope. Now, some of these are going to seem extremely obvious. You may say, well, you know, that's just so obvious it's probably not worth mentioning. Uh, but, uh, you know, my presumption continues to be uh, that uh, those of you watching this video are, for the most part, beginners who may not know very much about the hobby or about telescopes or the kinds of things that are available that might be helpful to you as you move along through the hobby. So this is intended for you, and I'm proceeding on that basis, so uh, hopefully you'll learn something in this video that might be a benefit to you uh, as you go out there to set up and, and proceed to view things or image things through your telescope. So uh, let's uh, 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 look at some things that uh, I have found to be, in my own experience, helpful to me now, these are going to be, for the most part, simple things. Some of them are going to be things that you don't really need to buy or spend money on. Nothing that I'm going to talk about here today is going to break the bank. Uh, uh, they're just going to be uh, sort of simple, basic, straightforward things. Now, you probably already are aware that uh, there is a, a tremendous abundance of astronomy gear, <laughs> telescopes, and related equipment on the market out there. You can buy almost anything that you can imagine to help you along with this hobby. Some of it inexpensive, some of it moderately so, some of it frightfully expensive. Uh, and, you know, it, it can be bewildering to just kind of consider all the things that are available out there and try to decide which things might be uh, of practical benefit to you as a beginner. And that's what I hope to, uh, to get across in this video, just to give you an idea of that. Now, I'm not going to, there are many, many other things that I could mention that I won't mention in this video in the interest of time, but this will give you a good idea of some of the kinds of things that are available uh, that will hopefully help you to have a, a better uh, experience uh, when you're out, uh, you know, pursuing your hobby. So uh, let's just get started with some extremely basic things. When you go out at night into your backyard or your driveway or wherever your viewing uh, area might be, you are from time to time going to need to have a light of some sort. I mean, you're out there in the dark, you're trying to do things, and sometimes you just need to have things illuminated a little bit. So you're gonna need, you know, a light. I have this, this is a, a flashlight. Now, uh, you wanna make sure that you've got a red light source with you out there when you go out to view uh, at night because you're going to have established some level of night vision out there, uh, hopefully pretty good level of night vision. And the minute that uh, white light hits your eye after you've established night vision, that night vision is gone and you're gonna have to spend the 20 or 30 or 40 minutes all over again to get that night vision reestablished. You can get around that problem by using red light. And so you wanna make sure that you've got something that is a red light source. Uh, that's uh, this flashlight provides me with that. And as you'll see soon, I have another source of red light out there. This is what you're gonna wanna use so as not to destroy your night vision. Uh, I would also suggest though that you need to have a white light source with you when you go out there as well, uh, primarily to use at the end when you finish your viewing or imaging session and you're you know, taking things down to take them back inside or whatever, wherever you keep your equipment when you're not using it. Uh, it's nice to have a nice bright white light to kind of shine around on the ground or the patio or wherever you are to make sure that you're not leaving anything behind that you might not want to leave out in the weather or whatever. So uh, a light source, both a red light source and a white light source 
are something that you're going to need when you're out there. Uh, and you can use a flashlight or there are several other ways of, uh, of giving yourself that light source when you're out there in the field. So you will need that. Uh, a second very simple thing that I'm going to recommend to you is that it's, uh, it's uh, a good thing to have something to cover your head and your eyes when you're viewing or imaging through your telescope uh, to block off some, uh, some of the uh, localized light pollution that might exist wherever you're doing your viewing. You know, I know in my case, uh, there are some street lights, uh, some of them very bright. Uh, where I do my viewing is at a place where there are roads on two sides of the viewing area. Sometimes there are automobile headlights that uh, can be a problem. So if you have, you know, uh, localized light pollution sources, it's very, very helpful uh, and, and very, very uh, uh, important to preserve your night vision by having something that you can bring down over your head to block out some of that localized light pollution. Uh, I would suggest to you that it can be something as simple as a basic hoodie. You know, uh, even in the summertime, uh, it's a good idea to maybe have a hoodie or something else out there to cover your head uh, to help block out some of that localized light pollution. It can make a big difference in your viewing experience. If you can block that out, uh, you can see much better through your telescope. And so uh, I would recommend that. You can buy things called astronomy hoods, I believe, which are basically vests with a hood on them uh, to accomplish that purpose. That Those can be quite pricey, at least that's been my experience when I've kind of shopped around for those a little bit. So I just use a hoodie and sometimes I even just drape a cloth over my head, one that will come not only over my eyes, but also down over the... Uh, you know, the, the eyepiece of the telescope to help make sure that this uh, uh, localized light pollution doesn't get in there and impact the optics of your telescope. So something to put over your head and maybe your eyepiece to help block off that localized light pollution is another very good thing to have uh, out there with you. Uh, uh, if you're going to be out, particularly in warm weather and especially in the kind of area where I live, uh, there can be a problem with uh, mosquitoes and other insects, and that can be very, very annoying and can detract from your enjoyment of the experience being out there viewing and imaging uh, and pursuing your hobby. So you might want to consider finding something that you can apply to your skin, a spray, a cream, or whatever, uh, an insect repellent of some kind. You can use one of these things that clip onto your waist or your belt or somewhere else that has a little fan in it with some chemical substance that gets, you know, uh, blown out. Uh, just having a fan uh, somewhere close to where you're viewing, you know, with a stream directed towards you and your telescope, you know, mosquitoes and other insects don't like to be caught in wind. And so a fan sometimes can be very helpful in, uh, in repelling those insects and keeping them away from you. Two things there though. Number one, you probably have to have a power source to power the fan. And number two, you want to make sure that that stream coming out of that fan is not too strong because it'll cause movement and vibration uh, uh, among your telescope and your optical equipment, and especially if you're trying to take a picture through your telescope. That might not work. But uh, my wife and I uh, own and operate a, a small uh, child care facility. Uh, and we take the, the children out for uh, 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 outside play, weather permitting. And in fact, you might be able to see a little bit behind me here of the little playground that we have for that purpose uh, out here. And uh, uh, over the years, through trial and error, we have found something here that's very good. I'm not promoting this product. I'm just telling you that such products do exist and you can look around at them. This is a product called Bug Guard Plus which is both uh, uh, sunscreen, which of course we don't need if we're out there at night looking at objects in the sky, but we found this to be an extremely effective bug repellent for not only mosquitoes and such insects like that, but it's also an excellent tick repellent, which is something else that you might want to be concerned about when you're out, uh, you know, outside. Uh, and so, you know, there are products like this that are very good. This happens to be a cream. And, but that's just a consideration for you. Give some thought to protecting yourself 
from bugs out there. You don't want to come back in, you know, with mosquito bites all over you. You don't want to be annoyed when you're out there trying to enjoy your hobby and these bugs are just making it almost impossible to do so, which happens to me here where I live uh, far too frequently. So I've had to take measures to try to protect myself from that. Just something to think about. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, uh, this, uh, the next thing I want to mention is uh, a dew shield. This is a dew shield. Uh, now, why would you need a dew shield? Well, if you live in an area where there's can, where it can be hot and humid at night, or if you live in an area where the formation of frost crystals on your uh, optics of your telescope might be a problem, uh, I have found that a dew shield can, can really be of help uh, in helping to alleviate those uh, conditions or circumstances. Uh, this is one that goes on my large 8-inch telescope here. Uh, it's just a, uh, a flexible, flexible plastic tube uh, that fastens with Velcro here, and it fits over the end of your telescope. It's lined with felt on the inside, and that will help to collect uh, some of the dew that's going to condense on things out there. It'll collect and be absorbed by this felt and will not reach the optics of the telescope. And I have found that that is really of significant benefit in helping me combat the issue of formation of dew when I'm out there. Uh, my small telescope here has a built-in dew shield, shield here at the end, which is very nice. But I strongly recommend the use of dew shields to help you deal with the problem of condensation of moisture in the form of dew uh, when conditions are right for that out there at night. Now, you can take that a step further and, and buy something called dew heaters, which basically are straps or some sort of apparatus that fits around your telescope uh, and that will heat things up a little bit just to keep your equipment at a slightly higher temperature than the surrounding you know, ambient environment and thereby prevent the, the formation of dew on your optics. Uh, for some of you, this might not be a problem. For me, it is. I happen to live in the American South where temperatures can get very warm and where there's often uh, pretty high humidity and I fight dew through the warmer months. Uh, it's a serious issue for me. Uh, this helps. I'm thinking about looking into this issue of the dew heaters. Uh, I don't know how many times I've come in after an evening's viewing to find everything that I had out there with me just completely coated <laughs> with a coating of dew. And so you need to try to take some measures to combat that. If you're in an area where that's a problem, a simple uh, uh, dew shield uh, is, uh, you know, can certainly help with that. Okay. Now, uh, something else that uh, is just sort of an obvious thing, perhaps you haven't thought of, I strongly recommend that you take something to sit in when you're out there for an evening of viewing or imaging through your telescope. Uh, now, I realize that it's difficult to, to sit in a chair and be able to get to your head to the right place where you can look through your eyepiece or through the live view screen on a camera or something like that. Doesn't always work, but even if you can't sit in your chair the whole time while you're out there, you know, uh, 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 viewing or imaging, it's still nice to have something to be able to, you know, take a load off once in a while and sit down and just rest for a minute. It's very difficult to stand up through a long viewing season, through a e uh, session, through an evening uh, out there. So having something to sit in or rest on can be an important consideration. Now, I just use a, a lawn chair, you know, just an ordinary uh, common lawn chair and uh, uh, just to have something to sit in occasionally. And I can sit in that chair and relax, for example, while, my, uh, you know, I, while I'm taking uh, numerous uh, uh, long exposure photographs through my telescope. You don't really have to be there while you're doing that. You can just sit in a chair and relax. So I would, there are things, by the way, called astronomy chairs, which are like inclined or, uh, or oblique ladders, sort of, that have a seat that's adjustable and you can just move it up and down to the right height as uh, circumstances require. Uh, I've seen videos of those and I, I can see where those would be very nice to have. Uh, they tend to be a little bit pricey, at least for me, so I content myself just with making sure I've got a chair out there just to sit in to rest occasionally if nothing else. So. Uh, 
very, very uh, uh, something you might really want to consider is to make sure you have a chair or something to sit in when you're out there for a night's viewing or imaging. Uh, now, let me uh, mention a couple of things here uh, that uh, uh, will be more uh, uh, significant to, to you uh, if you have certain types of telescopes. Uh, but this really applies to most everybody, I think, this next thing here. Uh, it's important to try to get whatever object you're viewing, in most situations, as close to the center of the field of view as you can get it. Now that's whether you're viewing uh, uh, through just through an eyepiece, uh, through with a telescope on a manual mount, uh, because typically, uh, unless you've got extremely nice or expensive eyepieces or field flatteners or those kinds of things, uh, typically uh, when you look through the eyepiece, when you're looking through a telescope, what you see in the center of your field of view is going to be much sharper, much more in focus than what you're going to see at the outer edges of the field of view. So it's important to try to get whatever you're looking at as close to the center of the field of view as you can. And if you have a, a computerized tracking mount, you know, that has motors and gears in it that can find and track objects across the sky, it's critically important that you align that telescope by getting your alignment stars right in the center of the field of view <coughs> when you're setting everything up. To help you get things in the center of the field of view, I have found this to be extremely useful and in fact, I've come to the point where I kind of regard this as pretty much essential. <clears throat> uh, uh, this is a, a 20 millimeter eyepiece that has an illuminated reticle. It has crosshairs in it. And so you can look through this and get whatever object you're looking at right in the center of the field of view by just centering it uh, where the crosshairs intersect. And I have found that to be uh, extremely valuable, extremely useful. Uh, I have this uh, <clears throat> uh, go-to uh, alt azimuth mount here, which does require alignment. It requires you to get two or three stars or bright objects in the center of the field of view to properly align it. And once I bought and started using this device, I find that my alignment is always much more precise and the ability of that mount to find and track objects has, uh, has grown significantly just by putting things right in the center of the field of view using this device. So you might want to consider getting one of these eyepieces with an illuminated reticle in it to help you get things in the center of the view uh, of your field of view, which will give you a better viewing and certainly a better imaging experience. I think this is a 20 millimeter uh, uh, eyepiece. Some of these uh, eyepieces with reticles in them are uh, a much shorter focal length and they give you a much narrower field of view. I would recommend that you get one with a fairly wide field of view, uh, uh, fairly long focal length because that just makes everything easier all the way around. Uh, I think I paid, I, I, you know, I really don't remember for sure. Um, uh, uh, I have a, a sense that I probably paid 60 or $70 for this uh, 20 millimeter eyepiece with this illuminated reticle. By the way, on this particular one, you can take the, uh, the reticle, the, this off, and use it just as an ordinary 20 millimeter eyepiece, and it's actually a pretty good one. So that is an accessory that I would recommend to help you get things in the center of view uh, of your uh, telescope, which will give you a better uh, viewing experience and a better imaging experience. Just something to consider. Uh, Next thing I want to mention here would be for those of you who, base, who have reflecting telescopes. Now, uh, there's a thing called collimation that you may already know about. Uh, and all telescopes can get out of collimation. Uh, it's very rare for a refracting telescope to get out of collimation because the primary lens in the end up here, the primary objective lens is set in place and doesn't move and it doesn't have to align with any mirrors or anything like that. Other telescopes, especially refracting, reflecting telescopes, do occasionally get uh, out of alignment a little bit, meaning that the two mirrors, the primary and the secondary mirror in that telescope, can get misaligned a little bit. Maybe you bump the telescope, maybe just moving it around over a period of time. 
uh, you know, can cause those, those mirrors to get a little bit out of alignment. And when that happens, you're not gonna be able to get a, a nice focused, sharp image through your telescope. You have to correct that problem by realigning those mirrors through a process known as collimation. Uh, I'm not gonna get into how to do that here today. That's uh, a subject for another video. Uh, but it basically involves turning some screws, some adjustment screws, uh, for either the primary or the secondary mirror or both until you brought them back into alignment again. But in order to do that, you need to be able to see when, when things are centered uh, within the field of view in terms of the relationship of the two mirrors within a telescope. And I have found uh, in collimating a reflecting telescope, this device to be of great help, of great value. This is simply called a collimation tube. And it just fits in your... Uh, a telescope where the lens would, uh, pardon me, where the eyepiece would normally go. There's a crosshair in there and there's a tiny uh, a hole in the top up here, not much bigger than a pin prick actually. And the idea is that you look through this hole and you look at that crosshair that you can see in there and that will uh, let you know when you've got your primary and secondary mirrors properly lined up uh, with one another to get your uh, telescope uh, into collimation. Now, some people don't use anything like this. They just use a, a cap that goes here within the focusing tube that has that small hole in the top, and they just kind of guess at where the very center of everything is. This will enable you to be much more precise. I found that to be really value, valuable in collimating a telescope. Uh, this, uh, I think this costs maybe uh, uh, 25 or $30, if I remember correctly. Uh, you can buy a laser collimator, which I've never used. It's considerably more expensive, but supposedly it's much easier and better to use to collimate your telescope. Uh, I have found that I've got good results in just using this so-called uh, collimating tube, collimation tube, which fits right in the uh, eyepiece holder of the telescope. Okay, so that's for those of you who might have an issue with having to occasionally, if not frequently, uh, collimate your telescope. Now, I have some uh, uh, something else here that uh, I highly recommend. We've, we've talked about this before. I did a video on how to achieve sharp focus. Uh, and so I'm just gonna mention this briefly here. This is called a button knob mask. Uh, it fits right over the end of your telescope here. And when you look through a star or some object in the sky with a Botanov mask attached to your telescope, that produces a diffraction pattern uh, when you look through your eyepiece. And you can use the, that diffraction pattern to achieve a sharp, nice, clear focus, much more so, much more precisely than just trying to eyeball it through the eye, eyepiece. So this is something that I recommend as well. Of course, these come in different sizes to fit different telescope tubes. They're not extremely expensive. They're moderately priced. Uh, this one was less than $20. Uh, some people make their own by 3D printing these and so forth. But I uh, recommend uh, as a, a really useful accessory, these Botanov masses, which are a really good focusing tool. So I recommend that. Now, I have some recommendations now for those of you who may have uh, you know, a, a computerized go-to mount. That is a mount that uh, it can find and track objects for you in the night sky. Very, very helpful, particularly if you're trying to take long exposure photographs of objects in the night sky, which we've talked about at some length in previous videos. You may have a telescope like that already. <clears throat> you may be thinking about getting one sometime in the future. You may start thinking about getting one of, one of those kinds of telescopes. I have one here. This is a go-to uh, uh, alt-azimuth tracking mount. And of course, since this is a motorized mount that has electronics and gears and motors in it that are necessary to track objects across the sky, it has to be powered. So you have to have a source of power. Now, many of these mounts will come with battery compartments uh, within which you insert double A batteries. This one, for example, has a, a compartment for inser inserting a pack of eight AA batteries. Now, <laughs> uh, I would not recommend trying to power one of these kinds of mounts using AA batteries. I've tried on a couple of occasions to use eight AA batteries in this mount, 
doesn't work very well. Uh, they don't last very long. Uh, uh, you'll start to, uh, they'll start to drain pretty quickly. And as they start to drain, you'll start to experience a degraded performance of your telescope. Your tracking and your go-to capability will suffer. So not a good idea to think you're gonna be able to power these kinds of mounts with AA batteries. Uh, uh, so that means that you're going to need some sort of external 12 volt power supply to power these go-to mounts. Um, and by the way, you can use these to charge or power other devices other than just your telescope mount as well. Many different ways uh, to, to use an external 12 volt power supply to power these mounts. Uh, uh, some people like to use marine batteries, for example, some other type of lead acid battery. Uh, uh, some people like to use these uh, devices that are used to charge dead batteries. Uh, you can uh, get a, a, an attachment that has a, a cigarette lighter connection in one end that'll fit in a 12 volt connector in a vehicle of some kind, and you can use that to power it. You can use uh, alternating current, AC current, if you have an AC adapter and if you have access to a power plug, of course. You can do that and you'll never have to worry about batteries at all. Uh, but for those of us who are not uh, close enough to an electrical outlet to do that, you have to provide another uh, another form. Now, some telescope makers make their own, uh, I think they call them uh, power tanks, maybe, uh, which are, uh, some of them are lead acid type batteries that, uh, you know, provide power for your telescope and also have lights built into them so that you can actually use these for <laughs> lights in an emergency situation and power outages in your home as well as using them to power your telescope and so forth. So you can get uh, use those kinds of things. Uh, you can rig together a lot of different ways to uh, provide this uh, 12 volt power that you'll need to power these telescopes. I elected to go with this. This is a, an ithium, a lithium ion battery. Uh, uh, this is sort of the pro version of this. Uh, it's, uh, it, it has worked out very, very well for me. It doesn't have any of the storage uh, or, you know, uh, life, uh, item life considerations that many lead acid batteries do. Uh, it has uh, two lights in it, a red light uh, and a, a white light that I can use if necessary. It also has uh, connectors in there so that I can charge my cell phone or other devices uh, uh, while I'm out there using it. And of course it connects directly to the, uh, to the mount and powers the mount. Uh, I've had this battery for almost a year now uh, and uh, I have only had to recharge it one time. Uh, it, this thing really does the trick. Uh, it lasts for a long, long time. Uh, it has a long shelf life, uh, even when it's not discharged. Uh, it's just worked out very, very well for me. I'm not suggesting or pushing uh, or saying for you to buy this battery. I'm just saying that this is what I elected to buy and it has worked out extremely well for me. The point here is that if you have a computerized go-to mount, uh, you will need some means of powering that mount and don't think you're going to be able to do that with double A batteries. That's, you know, that's going to be very inconvenient, very frustrating. That's just not going to work. You need to think in terms of getting yourself a, an external 12 volt power supply uh, like this or something similar to this that, that does the same function. So uh, there is that. Uh, you can spend a lot of money buying eyepieces for your telescope. Uh, a lot of money. Uh, if you've bought a telescope that came as a kit, you know, telescope, eyepieces, tripod mount, all of that all in one, which most people do, uh, especially beginners, uh, you're, you're probably going to eventually discover, if you haven't already, that the eyepieces that came with that telescope are not exactly uh, top shelf eyepieces. Uh, and you're going to want to uh, consider sooner rather than later buying some better eyepieces to use with your telescope, uh, which can get to be a pretty expensive thing. You know, good, decent eyepieces uh, are not cheap. And, uh, and so if you, if you buy, you can spend quite a bit of money, uh, you know, accumulating yourself a decent set of eyepieces with various focal lengths to meet different requirements as you go out to view or image. 
Uh, and there is an alternative to that, uh, which I have found to be very useful. Uh, it has saved me a lot of money and it saves a lot of time and sometimes some frustration. And that is this object here, which I've talked a little bit about in a previous video. This is a zoom eyepiece. Uh, now this eyepiece uh, will uh, has focal lengths from eight millimeters up to 24 millimeters. And so I can view at those focal lengths or anything in between simply by turning this zoom while it's still attached to the telescope. So you don't have to switch out eyepieces from one focal length to another uh, uh, when you're using this. Uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, you can have a wide range of focal lengths in one eyepiece here, rather than having to spend the money to buy four or five or six individual eyepieces of different focal lengths. So it can be a real time saver and a real money saver. Now these are not, I'm not suggesting that these are as good <clears throat> as standalone eyepieces. Uh, you normally don't get as good a field of view as you might be able to get with those other eyepieces if you buy ones with a decent field of view uh, and so forth. But uh, I have this one. This is a, a uh, happens to be a Celestron 8 to 24 millimeter uh, zoom eyepiece. Uh, it's, it cost about $90 when I bought it. Uh, and I've used it extensively and I've been uh, relatively pleased with it. Uh, I've used it a lot for, uh, for doing uh, eyepiece projection photography using my DSLR camera. It has threads at the top here uh, to attach a T-ring so you can attach a DSLR camera directly to this eyepiece, uh, again, for taking uh, eyepiece projection photography. And I've used it a great deal for that just change from high magnification to low magnification or anything in between simply by turning this ring here. That's something you might want to consider. You can get higher quality zoom eyepieces, uh, of course, but expect to pay about three times more uh, than you might pay for this one. But that's a very useful accessory that can save you time and money. It basically gives you a whole kit of eyepieces in one, and it's worth uh, uh, considering. Uh, 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 if you uh, if you don't have a lot of money to invest in uh, in eyepieces, so uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, I've, I know I've just scratched the surface here. Uh, there's a lot of other things that you could uh, think of or that you could get. Uh, you know, you can buy just about anything that you can imagine as an accessory or a piece of astronomy gear, again, from very little cost all the way up to extremely high cost, depending on your needs and your wants and your wallet. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of some things that I have found to be particularly useful and in some cases basically essential to my enjoyment of the hobby. Uh, everything from having a chair to sit in when you're out there to having something that can help to block out localized sources of light pollution, things to keep bugs off of you at night, things to help you deal with dew, uh, lights, especially a red light to help you uh, when you need a light but don't want to destroy your night vision, uh, inexpensive items to help you get better focus, things to help you collimate your telescope, to get things uh, centered in the field of view, uh, and something to power uh, a telescope if you have a motorized go-to uh, computerized mount. Uh, and so that's just an indication of some of the things that you might want to uh, consider, uh, uh, you know, kind of gathering together in a kit to take with you out there. Some things that I think will help you enjoy the hobby uh, and uh, that may be essential in helping you enjoy, enjoy the hobby. And uh, so just wanted to bring some of those things uh, uh, to your attention and show you uh, some of those things. And uh, now you can go forward and consider more things. And uh, if you have any other ideas of, of simple things like this that you think might be essential or really nice to have out there, uh, share it in the comment section of the video. And I will uh, uh, share those uh, also in a future video. Uh, and I'll be glad to get that kind of input from you. So hope this was uh, uh, somewhat beneficial to you. Maybe it is if you're a beginner, especially. And, uh, and so maybe I've uh, done something today that might help you better enjoy this wonderful hobby a little bit. I certainly hope so. That's the goal of all of these videos. Uh, let me know 
uh, in the comment section or by liking or disliking the video, or maybe even if you uh, would, uh, subscribing to the video. Those are all means of letting me know whether or not I'm accomplishing the goal of trying to help newcomers uh, move into the uh, 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 the enjoyment of this very great and very wonderful hobby of amateur astronomy. So uh, let's wrap this one up. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'm, it's going to be a while probably before I do the next video. Uh, I've got some uh, much needed vacation time coming up. So it's probably going to be at least a couple of weeks, if not longer, uh, before I'll be able to put together another video. But I will be back. And uh, until then, uh, thank you so very much for watching. I appreciate uh, you patronizing uh, this uh, channel by watching the videos. And uh, until next time, let me close as always by wishing you very sincerely uh, clear skies and good viewing.